This is our sixth installment on the series of messages titled, The Life and the Ministry of Jesus. The Life and the Ministry of Jesus, leading up to that Easter Sunday morning when he came out of the grave. Amen? Amen. Today is Palm Sunday, and we celebrate Home Sunday this morning in Matthew chapter 21 beginning with verse 1 we read about that event that we now call Palm Sunday now when they drew near Jerusalem and the they here is Jesus and his disciples when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage or Bethphage, however you want to pronounce it, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, 
Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude says, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, of Galilee. May the Lord richly add his blessings to the reading of his word. You know, Palm Sunday is a very special time of celebration for the church. It's a time when we commemorate that triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This event marked the last week of Jesus' life on this earth, in which he was to fulfill the passion, die on a cross, and three days later be resurrected to life again. And he did it for our redemption. He did it for our forgiveness. On that day, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a borrowed donkey's coat, one that had never, the Bible said, been ridden. The disciples spread their clothes on the donkey for Jesus to sit upon, and the multitudes came out to welcome him. I want you to imagine and envision this morning that event, that great event in history. Laying before him their cloaks and branches of palm trees, the people hailed and praised him as the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And as he rode toward the temple where he taught the people, where he healed them, and he also drove out the money changers and the merchants who had made his father's house a den of robbers and thieves. But listen, saints of God, the real purpose of Jesus in riding into Jerusalem was to openly declare and make public that he was the Messiah. Amen. That was the whole point of this. Before he had told his disciples, don't tell anyone. Before when he healed someone, he would say, go, be healed, but don't tell anyone. Because he knew there was a specific time for his death. He knew it was to happen the day before Passover. He knew that he was to be the Passover lamb. So he tried to hold back as much as he could because he realized the moment he revealed himself as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the moment he revealed himself as the Savior, the moment he revealed himself as, as Messiah, that there would be a great move to get rid of him and to kill him and to destroy him. It was this that he did to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah coming in to Jerusalem to declare his kingship. 
His ministry is no longer private, but now it's made known to everybody who he is. And the people responded. They responded by spreading their cloaks as an act of homage fit for a king. The book of Matthew says that the king coming on the foal of a donkey was an exact fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, and gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus was riding into the capital city as a conquering king is hailed by the people with enthusiasm and excitement and anticipation. But the people didn't understand the true meaning of this event. I want you to note that Jesus said in John 18, verse 36, that my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. That other place is a kingdom that is eternal in the heavens. And that's what Jesus was saying. My kingdom is not of this world. That's why the praise and the honor and the adulation that the people lavished on Jesus that day didn't last very long. They wanted a deliverer. They wanted a conqueror. As I said last week, they wanted a king. They wanted someone who could heal them and feed them and deliver them from Roman oppression. That's what they wanted. They were not really interested in someone who would set them free spiritually. They weren't interested in a savior to save them from their sins. They welcomed him out of their desire for a messianic deliverer or a military leader to lead them in revolt against Rome. That's what they wanted. Amen. That was their desire. There were too many people during that time who, though they did not believe in Christ as their savior, Nevertheless, they hoped that perhaps he would be to them a great temporal deliverer. That's what they were looking for, a worldly leader. These are the ones who hailed him as king with their many hosannas, recognizing him as the son of David. What did that mean? The son of David meant that he was heir to the throne. And that's what they wanted. They wanted him to rise to the throne. They wanted him to take Herod's place. They wanted him to take Pontius Pilate's place. They wanted him to rule over them and be able to feed them and heal them and deliver them. But saints of God, that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to save men's soul. Amen. That's why he came. And when he failed in their expectations, when he refused to lead them in a massive revolt against the Roman occupiers, the crowds quickly turned against him. Within just a few days, their hosannas to the king would be transformed into cries of crucify him, crucify him. Those who hailed him as a hero would soon reject and abandon him. You see, saints, this is how the human heart works. I want you to understand that. this. It's important this morning. That's how the human heart works. The heart of man is sinful. The heart of man, the Bible says, is deceptive above all things. God knew and Jesus knew that even if you change the form of government, even if you change the leader, even if you change regimes, if the people are corrupt within, there will be no real change at all. Amen. 
We experience it every four years in America. That's right. Amen. We change our leaders and think if we change the leader, all of a sudden everything in America is going to be wonderful. But you know it's not. Because just changing a leader is not going to bring peace. And changing a leader is not going to bring the presence of God and the power of God. It's the corruption that we need to deal with. And corruption begins in the heart. We have to deal with the hearts of men. You see, changing all of this that they wanted to change was just a cosmetic type of change. But God knows that first there has to be a change of heart. Amen. Can I say to you, that's why we need to be praying for Congress. That's why we need to be praying for the leaders of America. That's why we need to be praying for the president. <coughs> praying what, Pastor? Praying that the power and the presence of God would move in. And the power and the presence of God would humble hearts. And the power of and the presence of God would shake them to their core. And bring them to their knees to repent and give their lives to God once again in this nation. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. Yes. That's the only way there will really be change. But to be transformed. Simply means to be made better. To be better is not enough. We have to be made new. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, You must be born again. God wants to give man a new heart, He wants to give us a new mind. Transformed by the redeeming power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And praise God that on that Palm Sunday, Jesus taught us the greatest change has to come from the heart. We've learned to love others because He first loved us on the cross of Calvary. That's why the first words that came out of Jesus' mouth as he hung there on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Our need is a need of forgiveness. Our need is a need of salvation. Palm Sunday reminds us of God's plan of redemption. Matthew 21, verses 1 and 2 says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. So Jesus sends his two disciples to a nearby village. And there they will find a donkey and her colt tied. And he says, Bring them to me. I want you to realize that it was as if Christ has already made all the previous preparation. For what is about to transpire in this public presentation of his ministry. I want you to notice the minute details that Jesus gave to his two disciples on where they had to go, what they would find there, and what they will do, and do it, he says, right away. He spoke with authority. He spoke with demanding obedience from them. Every, listen, every minute detail has been properly planned and thought out. This event didn't just happen by an off-the-cuff decision or on a whim. Jesus knew exactly what needed to be done. He had a plan. He set it in place. He executed the plan. Go to the village. There you will see two donkeys tied. It's mother and the colt. 
and untie them. Bring them to me. And if anybody says anything to you, tell them the Lord has need of them. It was a deliberate, premeditated, meticulously planned out event in the mind of Jesus. Listen, that's the way God does things. God has a great plan in store for our salvation. Amen. He has a great purpose in store for each and every one of us. He knows that we have no ability on our own to go to Him because of sin. There's a dividing wall that separates us from God. And God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that by suffering and dying, he might, we might have life and have life more abundantly. Can I say to you, and I'll say it about me, I won't say it about you because I know it can never apply to you. That just like those two donkeys, I was a donkey once. Come on now. I was tied up. I was bound. Listen to me. I was bound by sin. I had no ability of my own to find freedom. I couldn't get loose. I was bound by sin. I was bound by alcohol. I was bound by the enemy. I was bound by Satan. I was tied. I was bound there. I couldn't get loose. And just like those donkeys, I, not you, but I was stubborn. I was self-willed. I was full of pride. In Mark chapter 11 verses 2 and 3. It reads like this. Jesus told his disciples. Go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it. You will find a colt tied there. Which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks. Why are you doing this? You tell them the Lord needs it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Unridden. Untamed. Not useful. In other words, useless. That's what I was. I was just a stubborn donkey. But one day, somebody came along with a message. And somebody set me free. Just like those donkeys were set free. And somebody changed my life. Listen, the Lord knew that this was a useless cult. He said, this colt has never been ridden. I don't know. I've, I've trained horses. I've broken horses. Not like you see on cowboy shows where they jump on its back and it bucks and it bucks until you ride it down to its knees. That's not the way you break a horse. But I've spent hours and days and weeks breaking horses. I know what it takes. You can't just get on an unbroke horse's back. You can't do that. But listen, saints of God. One day, this unbroken colt, this donkey, met Jesus. Hallelujah. And he changed my life. He changed my heart. He set me free. He turned me loose. Saints of God, God knows every one of us intimately. He's designed us in the womb of our mother. He has a blueprint of our lives. He set your DNA. He knows exactly what's going to happen to you. He knows where you're going. He knows what you're going to face. He knows what you're going to go through. But if you let him lead you, he will lead you and he will guide you and he will direct you and he'll change your life and he'll give you what you need in this life. Amen. Would you give him praise and glory in the house? I want to say to you this morning that the Lord has destined a place for each and every one of us to go. There is a special place. You see, it's just as important where you are as what you do. I want you to think about that for a moment. 
I think it was Elijah who God says, God, that the Bible says God led him there by the brook of Cherub, or whatever the name is, <laughs> by the brook, and there he fed him and took care of him and provided him. The there in your life is very important. I want to ask you this morning, where are you in Jesus? Because the where is so very important. Where are you? God has a destined place for each and every one of us. God has designed each and every one of you for a place of ministry. Amen. Where he wants you to minister. How he wants you to minister. But listen, we have to be willing to be led. Just like those two donkeys had to be willing to be led. The Lord has a specific purpose for each and every one of us. Not all of us can be preachers. Some of us are called to be miracle workers. Come on. Some of us are called to be intercessors. Call out the names of people in prayer because that's your calling in life, to intercede in behalf of others. Some of you have a calling to be a prayer warrior, to spend time alone with God, to let God use you. Some of you have a calling on your life as an evangelist to tell others about Jesus and what great things he can do in your life if you'll just let him. Tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Some of you have a ministry of worshiping. Has God called you into the ministry of worship and praise to, 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 to spend time before God lifting up His name, worshiping and honoring and bowing before Him? But whatever your place and whatever your purpose, we have to give in to His leading. We have to listen to His voice for the Lord has need of them. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Isaiah 59 and 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. So that he will not hear you. But Romans 5 and 8 says. That God demonstrates his own love for us. Amen. In this. That while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. Acts 3 and 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? Can I say that Jesus has a purpose on that Home Sunday day, Jesus declared his purpose. And he has made a way for each and every one of us to know our purpose, our calling, our place. He's made a way for each and every one of us. Majesty, worship His majesty, unto Jesus be your glory, honor, and i 
Jesus, the King, majesty, oh, worship his majesty. Oh, 